Hi, I'm glad you've uh, chosen to join us for this third installment of the series that I'm doing on geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. Uh, today, what we're going to cover uh, is controlling geometric tolerances, and we're going to look at our first of those uh, controls that we have on geometric tolerances, uh, that being position control. In addition to that, we're also going to look at something called Rule 1 of GD&T, and uh, so, but before we get started with all of that, we need to go back and review a couple of ideas uh, that we've touched on in a previous video. The first of those is this idea of uh, controlling a feature of size. So, first of all, what is a feature of size? Well, it's any kind of a feature that can be measured across opposing points on a part. So, the example that was given, I believe, last time was this idea that anything you can measure with the head end of a caliper that's typically going to be a feature of size and you can sort of measure across from one side to the other of an external feature like this one um, you could also measure from one side to the other of an internal feature like this hole represented right here one uh, one thing that is not a feature of size would be something like the depth of a hole or the location of one um, maybe feature of a part uh, where it doesn't have some sort of an opposing side that you can measure relative to. So that's the idea of a feature of size. And one of the things we want to point out here before we get too much further is to say we said earlier that only features of size will employ the direct you know, plus minus uh, tolerancing technique or a unilateral tolerancing technique that was uh, featured in regular um, you know, coordinate tolerancing systems that, uh, that you may have seen in other contexts. So with GD and T, uh, we only employ those plus minus uh, type tolerances on uh, these features of size and no other uh, items in a drawing that would have uh, dimensions on them. The other thing that I wanna review here is this idea of a tolerance zone. So one of the big things that we do in geometric dimensioning and tolerancing is we define uh, geometry that where that geometry will contain all of the points that are a part of the actual surfaces of a real part. So, and the way that works, uh, for example, with this one that I have here on the screen, if you have a part that is this sort of, um, you know, imperfect cylinder-like feature, the way you know whether or not that feature is acceptable is you define two perfect uh, sort of counterparts to that feature. Uh, one that's sort of the maximum extent that that material can extend, and one of them is the minimum extent that that material is allowed to go. And the entire surface of that feature now needs to be within those two uh, sort of limits of that range, and that's how you know whether or not your part was acceptable. And this kind of is where the name of geometric dimensioning and tolerancing comes from. It's the fact that you are defining that geometry that uh, sort of defines what those limits are of how big or small one of your features can be or you know, kind of the extents to which it's allowed to go versus places where it's not allowed to go. So these are two big ideas that we've touched on previously. And so I wanted to start with the review of these because they're important for what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, a new idea that we haven't really spent any time talking about yet is this idea that you can have, once you've set up this idea that there's a zone where you can have um, the surface of a part be anywhere in that tolerance zone, that means that you might have more material that is present there or you might have less material that is present there and anywhere in that range is an acceptable state for that part to be to accomplish what you've said it, it needs to accomplish or, or for it to be what you've said it needs to be. So let's talk about these two terms. One is maximum material condition and the other one is least material condition. Um, what you have here is I've actually got sort of the four possibilities for this kind of um, an idea here. One is that you could have an internal feature um, where you are at the maximum material condition. So this is kind of like a hole, or this is a hole, this example I'm showing you here. But it means that you have your maximum amount of material means that that hole ends up being the smallest possible hole that it could be. And that's when you have the most amount of material present that uh, is allowed and still stay within uh, 
the zone um, that is defined as being the acceptable zone. If you have your maximum material condition for an external feature, that actually means that like if it's a circle like this, its diameter is the maximum that it's allowed to be. Okay. Whereas for your least material condition, your least material for a hole is your biggest hole possible and your maximum material or your, excuse me, your least material condition for an external feature like a pin or a shaft is that minimum diameter of the pin or the shaft. So this is a, uh, some terminology that get you, gets used a lot in geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. And I wanted to go ahead and introduce it now, but I will go ahead and also say we're going to touch a lot more on these concepts in a lecture devoted specifically to this idea of modifying uh, certain uh, you know, limits that you put on your geometry using these modifier symbols that I've actually got over here. The circle M and the circle L, that's what these uh, are referring to as either your maximum material condition for the circle M or the least material condition for the circle L. Um, and like I said a second ago, you know, this has kind of different implications, whether you're talking about an internal feature or an external feature, but it is an un unambiguous way to refer to just how much material is present in either one of those cases. Uh, this is an example of where you might see those letters coming up. Um, in the upper example up there, you've got your maximum material condition that you've specified uh, for this tolerance zone. Um, whereas you've got a least material condition that you've specified for this other tolerance zone. Uh, we're going to actually talk a little bit more about what, this, um, what these tolerances might even indicate with this uh, position uh, symbol that's given at the beginning of that. So just hold on, we'll, we'll start talking about that just a little bit more. The last thing that I want to mention on this slide is that these maximum material or minimum material, excuse me, least material, uh, conditions are things that we can apply also to datum features. Uh, the only difference is that if we apply these concepts to datum features, uh, these are now called maximum material boundary or least material boundary as opposed to maximum material condition or least material condition. So anyway, this we wanted. I wanted to define these terms before we go too much further, uh, so that um, it it makes sense to us when we talk about this next thing. Okay. So let's get into what is rule one of geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. This seems like a good place to start since it's numbered one. And so let's start here. This rule is also known as the envelope principle. And here's what it says. It says that when only a tolerance of size, that is a plus minus type tolerance, is specified for a feature of size, the limits of size prescribe the extent of which variation in its geometric form as well as its size are allowed. Okay, now that is kind of, can be a little bit confusing to just read that. Basically it's this, by setting up your plus minus tolerance, it can be plus minus or it can be a unilateral tolerance either way, but by setting up that tolerance you have defined a tolerance zone and once you've said that tolerance zone has to contain all of the surface points of the feature that you're controlling, that not only controls the size of the thing, but it also to some extent controls the form. So this is, this is what I'm saying here with this first bullet. A tolerance zone for, a fe for feature surfaces is implied by just your plain tolerances that you've always seen on drawings. And here's one example of how this controls not only the size of the, of the feature, but also the form of the feature. Think about what if you have an, an external feature like a pin or a shaft, and you've set some plus minus boundaries on that. And by doing that, you've said all of the surface points of that uh, feature need to lie within that um, envelope, okay? Well, once you've done that, there is only so um, unstraight, let's say, that that surface can be before it starts to violate either the outside uh, envelope of that uh, boundary or the inside envelope of, that, uh, of what that thing is allowed to be. So it, it could violate either the tolerance zone toward the outside or the tolerance zone toward the inside. And either way, 
um, it's limited on just how unstraight that pin can be before it violates one or the other of those things. And so rule one of GD&T would control the form of that pin. One, one uh, aspect of form would be whether or not it's straight. It controls that to some level because the tolerance zone geometry is perfect and it keeps it from being it keeps the pin from being too far out of being straight. Another aspect of um, form control would be whether or not the surface is too rough, right? Whether or not the surface is maybe too jagged or whatever. Um, that other bullet before I leave it here, it's this is often a sufficient control on certain features without the application of some specific form control, some other specific form control like straightness or like something like the surface finish, um, whether or not it's too rough. Okay. Um, so here's another example. This one's for an internal feature, but it doesn't really matter if it's a, an internal feature or an external. But you'll notice there that the dotted lines um, that I put here as well as the solid lines, that actually the middle dotted line is what the basic size would be in this example. And the outer kind of more frequent dots out here would be the maximum uh, size that this thing would be allowed to be, whereas the um, black line toward the inside would be the minimum size it's allowed to be. Well, just by setting that up, you've said that all of the surface points of this hole has to lie between those two lines. And as long as it does, then you can acceptably let it vary, acceptably let it vary in that range. Um, and it will have met the requirements that you wanted for it to meet. Okay, so that can even include some misalignment. You know, that would be kind of like not being straight, like the last example that we just saw. And you would still not say that it's out, out of bounds or, or uh, out of spec. Okay, there's a couple of corollaries that come about once we've looked at rule one like this. One of them is that if you're looking at a uh, maximum material condition, okay, which means for a, for a hole like this, you've got your smallest hole possible. So if you're at this maximum material condition, that actually implies that you must have perfect form. Okay, the reason for that is that if you allow any points to go any further inward, for that example, then you will have violated your tolerance zone boundary. If you allow any material to go further outward, uh, relative to this, then you wouldn't actually be at maximum material condition. So this is a corollary that when you're at maximum material condition, that means you must have perfect form in that state. Um, if you are at least material condition, the same thing goes, right? For this, again, the example of the hole, if you allow that hole to be kind of as large as possible, if you let it at any point get larger than that or a point go outside of that tolerance zone, then you are violating that tolerance zone. And if you go any further inward, then that means that you are no longer actually at least material condition. Okay, so these are a couple of corollaries that come about uh, once you have uh, sort of figured out what rule one means um, for these materials. Okay, I'm just going to reiterate one more time. Rule one is often a sufficient control on certain features in terms of their form uh, without having to apply a specific form control uh, in addition to it. But not always. Sometimes as a designer, you will want to apply some additional form control of some kind onto your features. Um, and that's just going to depend on your application. Okay. All right. So let me ask a question here. We're going to shift gears just a little bit. If you gave a uh, a machinist a drawing like this one and said, I want this part made. Would the machinist know how they should proceed to try to make that part? And this seems like, well, sure, you know, you've put all the dimensions on there. You've said how big everything needs to be. You've said where the location of the hole needs to be. Why wouldn't a machinist be able to make this part? Well, look at that second line that I've got on the heading of this slide. Would a machinist know how close was close enough? Okay, because when it comes right down to it, once you start making parts, there is no way to make them absolutely perfectly. And so what we've implied by giving the machinists just what we've given them here with this picture 
it can't be made actually because what we we haven't said any level of tolerance that we have for it not being exactly that okay so is it okay if the machinist uh, say made something like this this is the example that we looked at a couple of lectures ago well I don't know right the machinist would look at it and say well probably not but you haven't told me how uh, far out of what the perfect ideal of this part would be how far out of that I can be and still be acceptable so um, I would say there isn't a way just yet for a machinist to actually be able to make that part that you've given them drawings for. Well, what if we add this thing down here, right? We've got this um, all dimensions plus or minus 0 0.01, okay? What if we did that? Would that make it possible to make this part? Well, let's start going through and seeing what this actually means, okay? Let's start with the whole. And I'm gonna, you know, up there it says tolerance zones implied by rule one. I'm gonna show with these little red lines, you know, how far out is this allowed to go? And, you know, I might have the size exaggerated a little bit relative to the uh, kind of the scale of this thing, but that's, what, that's so you can see this. So let's say we set up these tolerance zones implied by rule one like this, okay? Um, could a machinist make a hole that where the surface of that hole was entirely within those boundaries? Well, now I would say, yeah, the, the machinist could probably make that hole, okay? Could the machinist make the edges of this part so that the edges of that part, uh, the, all of the surface points of the edges of that part lie within those boundaries, right? I would say that's probably also possible for the machinist to accomplish that, okay? So uh, by looking in terms of tolerance zones that are meant by this all dimensions plus or minus 0.01, we've now made it much more feasible that that machinist might be able to actually make this thing and have confidence that by having made it within these bounds, it's gonna be acceptable to the person who specified it. Okay, now I have one that's a little bit more trickier, uh, a little bit more tricky here, okay? And it is, um, what about the location of the hole, okay? Now, if you look at the kind of the little crosshair kind of things that I put up there, it might not seem that tricky. You just say, well, let's just do the same thing we did with the others. Let's put a boundary to each side, top and bottom. And by doing that, we will have said how far away maybe the center of the hole is allowed to be. Here's why this is more tricky. Once you've allowed that center of that hole to start moving around, it now becomes somewhat ambiguous what you mean by what the shape of the tolerance zone is for the hole. Okay, so think of it this way. You know, you not only have the size of the hole that has some variability, and that's what, is, you know, sort of established where all the location of all those uh, points of the hole would be, but you've also got that somehow the middle point maybe is also uh, movable, and that makes it somewhat ambiguous what the actual shape is for the tolerance zone for the actual inner surface of that hole. Okay, so this is actually one reason why in gd &T we've said early on that we're not going to use plus minus tolerancing for anything but features of size. Okay, so if you have something that's not a feature of size, we're not going to use just plain plus minus tolerancing. It's partly because of this, it creates ambiguity as to what the actual shape is of those tolerance zones. Okay, so if we say, well, let's now, okay, let's scratch that, let's get rid of those tolerances and change our specification to all features of size plus or minus 0 0.01 inch, okay? So we basically get rid of that um, you know, constraint that we had on there. Now the question is, is it possible to make this part? And the answer is, yeah, this now is possible to know what our tolerance zones are for the different surfaces of this part. And yet, there still might be limitations and reasons why this might not be adequate, okay? And let me uh, explain this, okay? I'll go ahead and put that point up on here. This may not be um, all the flexibility that a designer needs. And so to kind of explain this, I'm gonna go to the next slide here, okay? And what I've done here is I've taken that note that said all features of size plus or minus 0.01, I've now kind of stated that 
in, uh, in more explicit terms for each one of the dimensions on this drawing, okay? Now let's think about it in terms of the size of that hole. Very often one of the things you need to do when you specify a hole is you need the tolerances of that hole to be maybe a lot tighter than some of the other tolerances that you would have needed elsewhere in your part. The reason for this is because in order for you to get the right kind of maybe interaction between the hole and the feature that is going to fit into the hole, okay, um, those tolerances need to a lot of times be very close. Think back to, we, we discussed the idea of having uh, slip fits versus press fits, um, kind of you can have free running fits versus things that are more locationally tight. Um, but anyway, you have these different kind of fits, but in order to get those, you know, a hundredth of an inch may be a very, very large amount of tolerance. Uh, plus or minus a hundredth of, in, uh, of an inch may be a very large tolerance for the size of that hole. Okay, well you might say, well that's no problem, let's just change it. Okay, maybe a more appropriate size uh, tolerance for the size of that hole might be somewhere between plus 0 0.002, right, two thousandths of an inch, to minus nothing. Okay, so that's more of a unilateral tolerance and it doesn't matter, but you can you essentially tighten up what that uh, tolerance would be, okay? Well, think about some of the implications of this now, all right? Once you've tightened it up like that, think of it this way. The sizes of those two cylinders are so small now because it can only go two thousandths of an inch bigger and nothing smaller that they will have almost vanished, right? It's almost down to the point where you can't even tell, you know, how big or small. Now here's the thing, it is possible to gauge the size of that hole to that level of accuracy, right? You can try different sorts of gauge pins and see if they will go into the hole or not, and that way you can know whether or not the size of that hole um, is within that range, you know, of 0 .000 to 0.002. But what does that do, okay? Is it still possible to make this part? Yeah, it might be possible, but one of the things you've now constrained the machinist to do is you've said that these sizes, these, uh, these basic dimensions, right, they're not sizes, they're basic dimensions of the six and the two, those now have no tolerance on them. You say those have to be right where they are. But the only way that the machinist has any sort of wiggle room on what the kind of where the, the edges of this hole are going to be comes purely from this size constraint and there's no maybe wiggle room on where the actual center of that hole can be. So it's possible to make this but it's also going to be very expensive and it tightens up uh, one of our tolerances uh, that is the location of the hole to a level that we probably didn't need. Okay, We could probably tolerate a little bit more um, you know mislocation of that hole while still needing the size of the hole to be tight, right? So I guess what I'm saying with this is that rule one, uh, now even though it hypothetically would work to be able to make this part, it doesn't give the designer enough flexibility to do things like independently control how tight the tolerance needs to be of the hole from where exactly does the hole need to be, okay? So we need a better technique of saying where exactly that hole needs to be uh, that's independent of how big does the hole need to be, okay? Just before I leave this slide, um, I'm gonna actually, um, and, you know, I'm gonna actually mention that there's other places where this might come into effect as well. So think of uh, the tolerance zone that we have for the edge of this part. The way that we have it set up right now, hypothetically, this edge of this part might have, um, you know, it might have a shape that looks something like this. Well, you might look at that and say, well, that's not perpendicular to the other faces that I would have expected it to be perpendicular to, okay? Here's the thing. There is some level of that, you know, sort of form control that happens due to rule one, right? You know, whether this side, whether you're curious about whether it's straight or perpendicular is not actually a form control, it's, uh, it's more of an orientation control, but still, there is some level that that can be tolerated within our rule one bounds, but maybe that's not what you were really trying to get at with this 
um, with this plus or minus size over here. Maybe you want that side to actually be more perpendicular than that, but you're okay with it being longer or shorter by the amount of uh, tolerance that you've identified here, okay? My point with this is that either way, either one of those examples that I just showed you, the, uh, the designer might need more flexibility on what they want to specify in terms of the tightness of this feature or the, you know, the one aspect of a feature versus another. Um, and so we need more controls on this, okay? So hopefully I've done a, a reasonable job of motivating that before I get into talking about how we're going to use some more of these, um, you know, these actual controls, let's go back and look at the table that we uh, visited earlier, I believe in the first lecture. We saw this table that had all these different kinds of geometric controls that are a part of the GD&T standard, okay? And there's two that I just sort of pointed out on that last slide. Uh, the main one we're going to look at today is this one that has to do with location, but I, also, I was also showing you um, that there's some level that this orientation um, control of perpendicularity was coming in on that last example that I just did. So um, why don't I do this for the, uh, the one that involves position, right? This is the specific one we're going to get into today, right? This position control. Let's look at a little bit more specifically for that uh, control, how would we go about reading one of these feature control frames for that control, okay? So here's how we would do it. First of all, the first element in the feature control frame gives us the symbol that describes the type of control that we are trying to apply, okay? And uh, so what this says is that the feature, right, and actually what we're going to see here in just a second is we generally mean something a lot more specific than that. We're generally talking about a center line or a center plane or an axis of a feature, okay? So specifically that part of the feature, center line, center axis, um, or a center plane. Um, in this example, we have this symbol right here that implies that we want our tolerance zone to be cylindrical in shape. Okay, so the feature must be positioned within a cylindrical tolerance zone, that's what this next little symbol means, of a size of 0.25 total. So whatever units you're using for your, your uh, drawing, um, this would be basically the diameter of the cylindrical tolerance zone that you've now specified. The next one I said we, you know, I'll mention it here, but this is when the feature is produced at maximum material condition. So this is called a modifier. And uh, again, I, I'm not really gonna get into that very much with this lecture, but we'll get into that in its own lecture eventually. Um, and then lastly, it says, with respect to the datum reference frame established by datum features A, B, and C, okay, where that order is important. A is the primary datum, B is the secondary datum, and C is the third or tertiary uh, datum. And then the other thing that's pointed out here is that you can also apply these modifiers to your datums. And so the way you would read that on this frame would be that datum feature C is at our maximum material condition, okay? So this is a little bit more specifically how you would read this feature control frame, which we sometimes uh, abbreviate FCF, um, how you would read this when you are trying to use a position control. Okay, now let's look at this position control in a little bit more specific example. Okay, this is basically a, a similar example to the one that we um, dealt with, in, you know, a couple of uh, slides ago. So what we're doing here is we're trying to control this same part, but you'll notice we've added a few other kinds of controls. Okay, I'm not going to talk a lot about them. But one of the things that we've done here is that we've said that there's a couple of uh, faces that need to be perpendicular. One of the things you got to do there is just literally apply those so that you end up with a reasonably um, tight uh, datum reference frame, okay? So where this, uh, this feature over here, B, you've said that's got to be perpendicular to A, which was this face over here, okay? Um, and it's got to do that within five thousandths or so. 
Anyway, my point is I, I don't actually want to talk about the perpendicularity constraint right now, but I'm pointing out that they are here to try to maybe establish what that uh, reference frame is within some level of confidence. Okay, the one that I do want to focus on here a little bit more is the one that has to do with the actual position control. Okay, and that is this one right here. Okay, what we're saying there is um, that we have a tolerant, a cylindrical tolerance zone again of a size that is a total of three thousandths of an inch. Now that number is just sort of arbitrarily picked there, but you can decide exactly what zone you want the center of that hole to be. You know, maybe based on a couple of slides ago where we had all dimensions plus or minus 0 0.01, you could have put a 0 0.01 right here, um, although that would have been a, a diameter, so maybe you would have put a 0 0.02 there, and that would allow this, the uh, position of that hole to move within a cylinder that had a diameter um, of 0 0.02 inches. But anyway, so that's what the size is of that, and it's with respect to features A, B, and C. What that means is that the hole has to be, the or the axis, I should say, the axis of the tolerance zone that we are setting up with this control. The axis of that tolerance zone needs to be perpendicular to, uh, to datum feature A. It needs to be positioned with respect to datum features B and C using the basic dimensions, right, of six, that's relative to C, and two, that's relative to B, okay? So that's kind of how you would go about reading this position control. Right, so a few things to say about this. Um, it says in your text, and I've noticed elsewhere as well, that this is most likely the most frequently used control that you see in geometri geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. Um, one of the things that this control does not try to control is the form of the feature that it is uh, helping to control. Okay, so what it does control is what the center line or center plane or axis is of a feature, a feature of size, but it doesn't try to control the size or the form of the feature itself. Okay, um, keep in mind, features of size, this is typically things like bosses or holes or tabs or slots, but there's anything where you can measure across opposing points, okay? Um, and that's an example of what we're trying to control in this case. That's the axis of the hole, okay? Um, what we are setting with the basic dimensions there is what we call the true position. The true position um, maybe doesn't, isn't what it might sound like to you. So a lot of times when people think of true position, they would go, well, that must be where it actually ended up, okay? That's not what it means in this context. In this context, the true position is the exact spot where you would have wanted it, okay? That's what you're setting with your basic dimensions, and you're setting it relative to your datums. Um, and that, those are the basic dimensions that I mentioned right there. Okay, I also mentioned this, when this diameter symbol is used, the tolerance zone is uh, a cylindrical shaped tolerance zone, all right? If you don't use that symbol, that diameter symbol there, what that means is that your tolerance zone is going to be the space between two parallel planes, okay? Kind of whatever you've got between two parallel planes, that space in between those is the tolerance zone if you don't have this diameter symbol used in the uh, feature control frame. Quick little point I'm going to make on this is that um, this definition that says that if it's not going to be a cylindrical tolerance zone, it's got to be the space between two planes, this is only true as long as we're talking about the position control. We're going to see some examples for some of the other controls where there might be some other options about what that um, tolerance zone shape might be. Okay. Here's a good question. Is the form of this hole controlled? Okay. Um, and uh, I would say this, keep in mind, I just put this bullet up here, that our position control does nothing to control the form of the hole. In other words, our position control doesn't control the form of the hole from being maybe too curvy as opposed to being straight. It doesn't control it from having too rough of a surface finish. 
None of that, okay? What does control the form of the hole is actually rule one. So if you look at the extents of the size of the hole, right, in this case going from one exactly, or 1.000 up to 1.002, that's our extents that are allowed for the size of that hole. That does, to some level, control the form of that hole because of rule one that we talked about just a few minutes ago, okay? And I'll mention this now, I think I'm gonna mention it again later, but um, what I have in this red box right here, okay, that's not actually a part of the position control, okay? The, uh, that's, all that is is it's controlling the size of the hole. The stuff that's in this box down here, that is what the position control is, right? That feature control frame, that whole feature control frame right there is the position control. But the thing that we have up here in the red box is uh, separate and, and uh, above that, okay? All right, so um, let's talk a little bit more about this position control and, and uh, look at what this means kind of a little bit more uh, geometrically and part of that is understanding it in a little bit more of a 3D kind of a space, okay? One of the things that we'll notice there is that this uh, tolerance zone that we're establishing right here, what it basically does is it establishes a little cylinder Okay, and this cylinder really doesn't have anything to do with the actual size of the hole. What we're trying to control with that cylinder is the space where the axis of the actual hole is allowed to be. Okay, and the axis of the actual hole, the actual feature that we're trying to make here, as long as the axis of that hole lies entirely within that cylinder, then we will say that we uh, have met this tolerance, okay? Um, and so there's a few things here. First of all, the tolerance zone itself has a perfect, perfectly true axis, right? So that's actually what this little gray axis is right here, okay? Maybe I'll try to point to it from this other side. This gray axis that, that uh, you see right here, that gray axis is perfectly perpendicular to plane A, right? Plane A, I guess I got rid of that view of this thing, but plane A is kind of the back side of this thing. That axis is perfectly perpendicular to that, and that axis is perfectly located with our basic dimensions of six and two for this example, okay? Um, and so that unambiguously locates this tolerance zone cylinder, okay? Now, once you've got that tolerance zone cylinder, that's what in turn constrains the limits to which the actual axis, right? That's what this black one is. The actual axis of the hole itself, you know, where it's allowed to be, okay? And I've got this all blown up a little bit more here. You see that gray axis being the one that's perfectly true, whereas the one that's allowed to vary as long as the entire axis stays within that cylinder, uh, for the tolerance zone, you know, it's allowed to move around in that tolerance zone. Hopefully that's uh, relatively clear. Um, I think I made this point a second ago, but I'll say it again, that upper and lower limit on what this hole size is, that's not actually a part of the position control, okay? These are dimensions of the hole. Um, you could apply those whether or not you applied this position control, okay? So that's just reiterating that point. Let's get into a few little finer points of these feature control frames, okay? First of all, how do you, what are the allowed ways that you can put these feature control frames on a drawing? And there's four different ways that are, that are outlined here. One is you can put the feature control frame on the drawing and point to the feature that you're trying to control with just a plain leader. Okay, so you've got that little arrow pointing in this case to that cylindrical uh, surface and that can be uh, one of the ways that you can apply a feature control uh, to that feature. Here's another way. You can attach your, um, you know, your control that you do to an extension line coming off of a planar surface. So the one that's showing there is this one down here, right? 
that is coming off of that planar surface and it's telling you that that planar surface has to be perpendicular to the datum um, applied by uh, you know datum A right there, the datum feature that's identified as A being that cylindrical piece, that's the datum feature, the datum itself being the axis of that feature, right? This axis that goes through the middle. This is applying a control to this face over here that uh, says it has to be perpendicular to that datum. Um, and again, we'll get into the perpendicularity control later, but just kind of pointing out how an another way that you can attach a feature control frame to a feature. Um, here's another one. You can put a uh, feature control frame directly uh, below a note or a dimension. Okay, so this is a feature control frame. We're putting it directly below this dimension. This is actually how we did it just a second ago um, when we were uh, trying to put our uh, position feature control frame on our last thing. We put it right underneath the dimension of the hole. So that's another way we can do it. And here's the last one that we can look at, and it is to uh, uh, attach it to an extension line of the dimension line for a feature of size, okay? So these are the four different ways that we can put a feature control frame on a drawing. Here's another little point. Um, only attachment methods C and D, these are the only ones that um, are acceptable to try to control axes or center lines of features. And if you want to do that, you can only put them in views where those show up as lines. Like think about in this example for these examples C and D, if that feature that it's referring to is cylindrical, then if you looked at a view, you know, 90 degrees set off from the views that we're looking at here, that axis would now look like a point and you're not allowed to kind of take a, um, one of these feature control frames and indicate that point. You have to do it in a view where it looks like a line. So these are kind of some finer points on how you would apply feature control frames to drawings. Um, and there's, you know, just to mention here one other kind of fine point, and that is in cases C and D, the feature control that we're trying to apply right there applies to the axis that uh, is associated with this, whereas the one that we have in case A that applies to a surface. And uh, the distinction between those is something I'm not gonna get into right away, but there is a, a small distinction between a, you know, indicating the um, straightness of this part is what this is doing right here, applying to a surface as opposed to it applying to an axis. Okay, um, I think I maybe mentioned this earlier, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it again. The numerical value used to indicate the tolerance is always a total tolerance, okay? So if you're talking about uh, cylindrical tolerance zones, you're always talking about the diameters of those cylinders, not the radius values of those cylinders, okay? And that's with, you know, when you're using the little number inside of your tolerance, um, you know, or your feature control frame, that's always, if you're talking about a cylindrical shape, it's always going to be a diameter, not a radius. Um, and then if you're talking about something more like the space between two planes, like I was talking about earlier, you're always talking about that overall distance, not a, you know, maybe a plus or minus kind of a way of looking at it. I'll also say this, I said between uh, tolerance zone surfaces, um, I, I meant to say that as opposed to planes because one of the things we're going to see when we get into some of the profile controls in particular is you can have uh, certain controls set up as the space between two non-planar surfaces. So, uh, but even in those cases, you still don't apply this as a plus minus, you do it as um, an overall distance between those two control surfaces. Um, here's another point. Um, when you're dealing with these feature control frames and you need to apply more than one control to a particular feature, you can stack the feature control frames on top of each other. And when you do that, um, you apply each one of them and you do them in the order that you stack them top to bottom, okay? So in this example right here, you've got a position control in the uh, first on the stack of feature control frames. 
and then you go to a perpendicularity control in the second in the stack of the feature control frames. Okay, um, And there's even a one slightly finer point that I, I need to put on here as well. You might see two different cases where you have um, maybe some position controls applied and these two do not actually mean the same thing as each other. Okay, If you see them where you have two different times that the symbol for the geometric control is being used, it means that those are two separately applied um, controls that are being applied there. Uh, they're applied individually. And uh, sometimes these are called multiple single segment controls. We'll get into that in just a few, a few minutes. Uh, versus the other case down here where you have just one symbol used, and in this case, this is called a composite feature control frame. And I'm going to show you one example of where that comes up uh, pretty frequently in drawings um, toward the end of this lecture. Um, I think I said this earlier uh, as well, but the um, maximum material condition and least material condition modifiers uh, aren't going to be dealt with in this lecture but uh, stay tuned and I'll, I'm planning on doing another lecture a little bit later on specifically on what to do with those modifiers when they are included in these feature control frames. Okay, um, let's look at this other possibility that we need to be able to deal with and it's this. A lot of times in uh, real applications there are a number of features that you want to put into a part and what matters to you is that each one of the features in a pattern of features have to be fairly tightly controlled relative to each other, but the overall pattern maybe can move around a little bit and you can sort of tolerate that. Okay, Here's an example. You need the head of your uh, automotive engine to be able to line up with the block of the engine, and you need all of those holes to line up with each other or else you won't be able to get all the bolts through them. right? They've got to be fairly tightly aligned with one another. It might not be quite as critical that that overall pattern of holes, um, that that overall pattern of holes be exactly positioned for one of the castings relative to the other casting. Okay, So maybe you can tolerate a little bit more um, misalignment with respect to how the whole pattern moves with respect to e each one of the parts, but you got to get that pattern relatively tight so that all of the bolts can go through the holes and make it into where they are going. Okay, If you've ever actually tried to make parts um, you know, yourself or you're trying to build one part to interface with another one and you need to make a number of holes in one part perfectly line up with a number of holes in the other part, you know how tricky this can be. Um, at Louisiana Tech, where I teach in our freshman curriculum, one of the things that we have our students do is build um, these little pumps. Okay, And when we build these little pumps, there are four holes that we have to get to line up so that they can screw the faceplate of the pump onto the body of the pump. Okay, And in order to make this possible um, with that, you know, for relatively amateur machinists for most of them, uh, in order to make it possible for all those holes to line up, one of the things that we do is we first have the students drill the holes in the faceplate only. Okay, We have them mark where they want those holes to be and then drill those holes in the faceplate. Once they've got those holes in the faceplate, they then take that faceplate and clamp it to the other part and the faceplate is then used as something that's called a drilling jig in order to drill the holes exactly where they need to be so that they line up, right? Exactly where they need to be into the other part. Okay, well that technique of using a drilling jig is something that is not uncommon at all when you're looking at uh, even larger scale manufacturing settings. Having a jig that you set up to make sure that your spacing between each one of your holes is just right um, is, is not uncommon at all. Now, one of the things that you've got there is that then the entire jig that you're using to drill the holes, um, you've got to position it uh, in a reasonably uh, you know, close position to where you want the pattern of holes to be on the part that you're drilling the holes into, but maybe the location of that jig has more uh, ability to have some tolerance to it 
than the actual position between the holes. So this is where uh, we need a technique of specifying that the distance between individual features is relatively tight, whereas maybe the overall pattern has a little bit more ability to move uh, before causing the, the part or assembly not to function. Okay, before I leave this uh, slide, I'm gonna just mention this before I go. Um, it is actually kind of important on engines like this for the head to line up relatively closely with the block, right? So the head is this part up here and the block is this part down here. That is kind of important for it to line up and one of the techniques that they use in order to make that happen and not have to have quite so many holes that all line up you know with a really tight tolerance that would be kind of expensive instead of having all of those holes where they have to line up really really tight tolerance what they do a lot of times is they use these things called locating pins and those locating pins are you know in this case two locations that are made to pretty high levels of tolerance that make sure that the head of the engine is located properly relative to the uh, block of the engine, okay? And they can do that with those two fairly precisely uh, located holes and then the, uh, the rest of the holes don't have to be quite as precisely made. All right, so let's get into the specifics of how we would control uh, that, uh, you know, the pattern as well as the features within the pattern, okay? What we would do is we would do that with something that is called a, uh, it's called plots and fritz. And what I always think of whenever I think of plots and fritz are uh, these two guys, uh, Hans and Franz, if you remember them from Saturday Night Live, where they're gonna pump you up, right? So anyway, the idea here is, um, you know, we're, we're dealing with a pump here, so, you know, maybe it's appropriate that we would have Hans and Franz here. But we don't have Hans and Franz, we've got Plots and Fritz. So, uh, first of all, the Pattern Locating Tolerance Zone Framework. What this does is it establishes um, usually a relatively looser uh, set of um, kind of zones within these features, you know, where they have to exist. And what this is doing is establishing the limits to which the pattern of features is allowed to move around, okay? Same concept as, as far as the, the uh, shape of the tolerance zone and how it works and everything, but it's applying to the pattern of features, not so much to um, the individual feature pattern. Uh, it's not individual features themselves, right? It's, a, it's applying to the pattern, not to the, the features themselves. The second row here is called the Feature Relating Tolerance Zone Framework. What it does is it basically um, takes the pattern that's implied by the uh, basic dimensions for the original, kind of what the pattern was supposed to be in terms of its ideal shape, right? It takes that and breaks it loose and allows it to float relative to the you know, like where you or your ideal position would have been for those things and here's what that might look like okay um, you might it might be okay if that pattern was located something like this right um, that hole as long as each of the holes is located in its proper location uh, relative to the other holes then um, you can be fine as long as uh, all of the axes of your actual features lie within both tolerance zones, right? So it has to be both inside of the green circles as well as inside of the red circles. And you might even notice here that I allowed this little green circle to sort of extend outside of the red circle a little bit. That's okay. Uh, the guideline that it gives in the, in the text here is that the as long as the axes of the Fritz tolerance zones, right? As long as those axes still lie within the plots tolerance zones, then you're, you're okay, okay? But this might not be the only spot that would be an okay for that Fritz tolerance zone. You know, it would also be okay for it to slide over a little bit, and uh, that would be another acceptable place for it to be. And again, as long as the features themselves, right, the, the actual axes of the features, in this case holes that you're actually making, um, as long as those axes lie within both of the tolerance zones, both the plots tolerance zones as well as the Fritz tolerance zones, then you have defined yourself a, uh, an acceptable um, 
you know, outcome as far as what the, how the part is actually made, okay? So here's what that look, might look like in 3D, right? You're actually establishing these cylindrical tolerance zones uh, for the plots originally, that's the bigger red ones, right? And, uh, and then you've got these smaller green um, tolerance zones inside of those, okay? And, um, you know, the way that this is set up is, you know, they're not showing you the actual holes themselves. They're showing you the shape of the tolerance zones that the axes of the holes themselves that are eventually going to be drilled, those axes of those holes have to lie within both tolerance zones for both the pattern located, locating uh, tolerance zone framework as well as the feature relating tolerance zone framework. Okay. Um, one last little point on this while you look at what the meaning is of plots and fritz. Um, it says in this note right here that the axes uh, of the rigid pattern that kind of holds the green uh, fritz features together, it says it's allowed to rotate. And I wanted to be clear here that the fact that we have this A included right here, okay, the fact that we've got A included right there, what that does is it makes it to where that Fritz framework is not allowed to rotate relative to the A datum, the datum uh, feature labeled A, okay? Um, and so the only rotation that it does allow is a rotation sort of in plane, that being a uh, rotations that occur as long as you stay oriented properly relative to the bottom of this uh, of this thing. So that's a, maybe a bigger point to make there is that with your, um, if you go back to our plots and fritz that we have right here, the second row um, only really is controlling rotations. It's not made to control translations, okay? So what you do with this example right here is you're constraining the rotation of that uh, tolerance zone framework for Fritz, right? You're constraining the rotation of it relative to uh, that back plane, but you're not trying to uh, constrain any kind of translation other than that the fact that it has to be inside of the plots, right? And, um, and you're not constraining rotation, um, you know, sort of as long as it stays uh, constrained you know, the, the axes are, are perpendicular to plane A. As long as they stay perpendicular to plane A, it can rotate in the other direction. Hopefully that makes sense. This stuff gets a little bit hard to describe. Um, maybe it'll make a little bit more sense by looking at a couple of other options. The other option, uh, well, this first, let's kind of review this original option that we had where our feature control frame has the thing fixed, um, you know, rotationally relative to A. Okay, this is what we mean by constraining the rotation relative to datum A, right? If you think about what shape the, the uh, plots framework creates on there, it's gonna be this cylinder that goes through here. And we're saying that the little green cylinders can float within the red cylinders as long as the green cylinders maintain some perpendicularity relative to datum feature A, okay? Well, let's contrast that with our other possibility here of removing that uh, reference to datum feature A. And what can happen there is you can end up with the uh, Fritz framework, right? The, the fact that you've got these holes that are all established relative to each other. That whole thing is now allowed to rotate relative to datum feature A. So now that no longer has to be perpendicular to datum feature A we've released that constraint, okay? And so what we're saying there is that now the axes of the feature relating tolerance zone framework can float anywhere as long as the axes of the um, fritz remain within the boundaries of the plots, okay? So that's the only constraint that we have left once we've removed that datum reference A in the second row of this uh, composite uh, feature control frame. Okay, well, let's look at another possibility. What if we add another datum reference? Now, in this case, we are adding a reference to datum B. Okay, so what this does is now we've constrained 
um, all rotation on the pattern of Fritz. Okay, so the reason that we know that is that we've now constrained rotation for the pattern relative to A. That constrains the perpendicularity to that face of A. The reference to B constrains uh, rotations of this pattern relative to datum B, which is up here. Okay, so what we are free now to do is translate, right, but not free to rotate. Okay, so you can see there kind of the, the motion of that pattern. It's allowed to move anywhere that it needs to within that pattern of the three red holes, but it cannot rotate, it can only translate. Okay, and that's what happens by adding that uh, other datum reference to datum B. Okay? Um, and so there's a little note that just kind of explains that. The line connecting those features must stay parallel to datum B. And I guess maybe even a, a more correct thing to say there is that the that line has to maintain its rotational orientation relative to datum B as the thing moves around. The most common thing that you'll see there is that it would be parallel, but it has to maintain its orientation relative to feature B or to datum feature B um, as it you know is allowed to float. Okay. Um, here's the last point that I'll make on this. No matter what, the actual axes of the features themselves, right? Think of the, the axes of each of the three holes that need to be drilled. Each of those axes has to lie within both the plots uh, tolerance zones as well as the Fritz tolerance zones, uh, regardless of where the Fritz tolerance zone framework floats relative to the plots framework. Okay. All right, one last little possibility. So first of all, let me just review. We left off with the possibility that we could do um, two datum references for this composite feature control frame. And what uh, resulted from that was that the, uh, that whole frame was allowed to move anywhere it needed to in there as long as it doesn't rotate at all, right? It can translate anywhere it needed to within the plots as long as it didn't uh, rotate, okay? What if you saw this thing that's actually called a multiple single segment feature control frame, okay? The difference in how it's written is now it's got two of these position control symbols as opposed to just one, okay? So with these two position control symbols, what we're now saying is that each of these um, controls, right, this, uh, you know, a uh, circular tolerance zone uh, with a diameter of five, right, is treated as one thing, and then this other tolerance zone with a diameter of two is treated as an entirely separate thing, okay? So it's no longer just saying you're constraining rotations only or anything like that. You can literally look at these two lines individually. So let's see if we can try to interpret what that would mean on this drawing, okay? So first of all, the first row does the same exact thing that we did with the first row uh, on the last possibility, right? Same exact thing. We're establishing these larger um, cylindrical tolerance zones, okay? Now let's look at the second row, okay? What we're doing there is we're defining smaller tolerance zones but we're only constraining those tolerance zones uh, relative to datums A and B, okay? So it's presumed that all three of these holes would maintain the, uh, you know, the, as far as the framework itself, that framework would be maintained between the three holes, but now we're saying that that framework has to be aligned, it has to stay aligned with datums A and B, but we're releasing the direction where it would be aligned with C. So what that whole framework can now do is that whole framework can be oriented uh, anywhere that it needs to be. It's, it's no longer constrained, let's say, by this, um, you know, this uh, basic dimension up here um, of 10, right? It's no longer constrained by that. It's allowed to move um, in order to find its best position or, or, you know, a position that works somewhere in between or inside of the uh, first row of this multiple segment feature control frame. Okay, so
uh, since what we're saying is this thing is not oriented in any particular place with respect to C, that means what it's allowed to do is slide like this. But you'll notice it has to maintain its orientation relative to datum B, right, which is up here. But it is allowed to slide back and forth because we've released its, in that second row anyway, we've released its uh, orientation with respect to C. So now um, that, that whole um, you know, relationship between the features is allowed to slide left and right as long as it stays within the um, pattern you know, location that we established with that first uh, row. It's allowed to slide within those. As always, I'm gonna say this one more time here, each of the features that we make, in this case, these are holes, right? Each of the features that we make, their axes have to be constrained to both tolerance zones, both the one established with the red as well as the ones established with the gray, regardless of where the gray might slide, um, our feature axes actually have to lie within both. Okay? Um, and uh, you'll notice here also that I'm showing where some of those gray circles might end up a little bit outside of the red circles. That's okay because that's taken care of with this last rule that I said down here where the feature axes have to be constrained by both uh, tolerance zones. Okay, um, so kind of the big picture of what we're doing with this multiple single segment feature control frame is we are allowing loose tolerance in one direction, right, left and right, while keeping tight tolerance in the up and down direction, as well as tight tolerance between the features themselves. Okay, so that's kind of the, what we were able to accomplish with that multiple single segment feature control frame. All right, let's kind of wrap up here. First of all, we covered um, the idea that rule one of geometric dimensioning and tolerancing not only controls the size of features, it also to some level controls the form of features because it establishes this envelope where the surface of the feature is not allowed to move outside of, okay? Uh, a corollary of this that we touched on was that if you have a feature that's either at maximum material condition or at least material condition, um, then you will have a feature that is a perfect form because that's the only way you can truly get to maximum material condition or least material condition, okay? We also defined a position control, okay? Um, and what this does is it controls, um, you know, kind of the big idea is it controls the location and orientation of feature axes, center lines, or center planes. It does this by establishing tolerance zones the tolerance zones can either be cylindrical in shape, which is a lot of what we looked at today, or they can be shapes defined by the space between two planes, okay? Um, and then lastly, we looked at being able to relate a pattern of features relative to each other and giving them some ability to have more flexibility about where the whole pattern located while keeping tighter tolerances between the features themselves. We did that with a pattern locating tolerance zone framework as well as a feature relating tolerance zone framework. Okay, and generally the way these are used is that you'll uh, try to get tighter control on the position um, of the overall, uh, excuse me, of, of the feature to feature relationships. You got tighter control on those relationships and looser control on where the uh, overall location of the whole pattern is going to be. Well, anyway, I hope that this has been some valuable information for you, um, and if so, I'd appreciate it if you would comment, uh, hit the like button, um, and uh, if you have any questions, also feel free to comment down there. Um, always appreciate it if you'll subscribe to my channel and sort of watch and see if there's any other content that I put out there. I am planning on putting out several more in this series of lectures on geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, so hopefully that um, is something that you might find useful down the road. Thank you for watching.